like you said, for $100, $150, you've got yourself a hot rod. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, without those days, automotive culture in this country is incredibly different. Having the hot rods lead to the muscle car craze and, and off mm -hmm. of that. So, yeah. You, are you, you could be my son. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I agree. I, I, I agree. <laughs>to another episode of in the driver's seat with abs we have a very special episode today it's the first of our california tour i'd like to say so we're not on the east coast for the first time so we're very excited about this we are at the legendary garage of mr bruce meyer we have him here in our built-up studio we like to joke that we add one piece of equipment to each episode we got these new fancy headphones we're very excited about those um, Bruce, we, we arrived in uh, L.A. yesterday, and our first stop from the airport was visiting the Peterson Museum, and we were absolutely blown away at the space, the cars. And, and I we, just want to add, even if we weren't seeing you today, we would have gotten off the airplane and yeah. gone to the Peterson. And uh, we're walking around. We're absorbed by the cars. It's a great display, obviously. Uh, Sean and I, being in operations, were in awe of how everything was laid out and just the infrastructure supporting that. Can you kind of take us through the restoration of that building and how it came to be what it is? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to hear that and welcome to yeah. thank you for having thank us. You. My yeah. little garage and and, and um, so Robert E. Peterson was the uh, publisher and the founder of Hot Rod Magazine, which was a magazine that I grew up with. And he was also a neighbor of mine, and we belonged to a group called YAPO, Young Presidents Organization, organization when we were younger. So we've had a great relationship over the many years. And um, obviously he had a love of automobiles, but his, I think his real passion were flying and, and hunting. Mm -hmm. um, but what he was really good at is, is, is uh, the art of the deal. And he loved opportunistic buys, and he bought real estate uh, smartly throughout Southern California. And he also had a, an art gallery. So he was a real renaissance man. He touched a lot of points. So he found this old building where the Peterson is now, which was built as a Japanese department store in the 50s. And then, and then uh, it became Orbox, which is a discount uh, ladies ready to wear. And then it just lay dormant for years. And... Somebody brought it to, to Peterson. It was a whole city block. You know, the building, maybe a couple hundred thousand mm -hmm. square feet, but, the, but it had a whole city block parking and so forth. So he decided, let's do a car museum. Now, he'd already had one in Hollywood that didn't go so well. Peterson, his taste in cars was a little more exotic than mine. I, I like the more traditional cars, but he loved the George Barris cars mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, movie cars. Mm -hmm. And he just loved all that, 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 that excitement. So... Um, he, he was also good at, at uh, putting deals together. And so we were both on the board of the Natural History Museum. And he came to the Natural History Museum and decided to partner with them. Um, that was a match not made in heaven. <laughs> uh, they could care less about the automobiles. Their, their approach to designing a museum was very much in line with dioramas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you'll see a leopard hanging from a tree or a... Sure. You know, they do these dioramas, and once you've seen the diorama, you know, there's no point in going back. Sure. You've seen it. So we had a lot of dioramas. The design was not fluid. It, it just it, it, There were a couple galleries that changed, but the, the fundamentals were there. So a friend of mine, David Sidoric, who was also on the board, I was the founding chairman, and I was chairman for the first 10 years. And, and so David Sidoric and I decided, you know, look, at this is not, this is getting old. Um, statistically, our, 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 our return visitors were 30%, hmm. 70% were first-timers. And you think, well, that's cool because you're 
you know, appealing to 70%. No, it's not cool. Because in a museum, you want the return visit. Yeah. You want that repetition. So we started doing the math, and it just wasn't working. And the dioramas were getting old. They, they were 10 years old. Car stuck in the mud and an old gas station, that kind of stuff. It just it gave us no, no flexibility. Mm. So, um, and David really led the charge. He, 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 he is a, a very bright guy. And so w the two of us interviewed architects and, and thought a lot about where we were going with it, but we decided we, we had to reinvent ourselves or go home. And um, there was an architect who just passed away this last month, Gene Cohn. KPF, Cohn, Pedersen, and Fox. Mm. Global architects had built buildings all over the world, but they had nothing in Los Angeles. And so Gene Cohn kind of, we told him that we wanted it red and chrome. That was David's mm. suggestion, red and chrome, you know, and just go wild. Yeah. So Gene kind of uh, did a uh, rendering of what you have today. We went to see um, Frank Gehry. Mm. And we, uh, Chris Bangle, we went to automotive designers. We went to a lot of different outlets to get concepts and to see yeah. who had the right thing. So am I going on too long on this? Maybe no, I, I don't, I don't want to take no, This is perfect. I don't know what, you know, so what your timing is. So uh, at any rate, we, we decided to go with Gene Cohn. And yeah. he, Frank Geary basically said, look, it, I'd be happy to do your building. He'd done the music center, which was like, twice the budget and twice as long. Yeah. And we were afraid going with a, a big name architect that it, it just wouldn't end well. Um, and he said, Give, get, I'll take a million dollars and then I'll design it for you and then you guys can go build it. Well, we didn't have a million to blow, so yeah, to speak. Yeah. And, and, and Gene Cohn had already done the renderings, which we liked. So we went ahead with it. And we, were, we spent $113 million on time, on budget. And then our management at the museum was weak. And we, we brought in a gentleman by the name of Terry Cargus. You'll meet him when you go there. Uh, this guy is fantastic, a, a fabulous human being, and uh, a, a real team builder. Oh. He had worked for Disney and, and theme parks, so he understood entertainment. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he's just a well-organized, good, good common sense guy. Yeah. He brought in Michael Bodell, who is, you know, your gen, mm -hmm. who can, you know, understand social media and keeping yeah. things alive. And, and we had Brian Stevens, who was with us before as a, as a designer, um, creative director. But I would say he just didn't have the right, the, the freedom it took or the, the right setting. But now the guy's a star. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have just a miracle team. And don't you go stealing them, because I'm... <laughs> well, that's the that's funny not thing. Fair. We were trying to learn from we them, were, Bruce. We're trying to learn. Yeah, we, we, well, we, don't we, steal. It's funny you're saying that, because like Ben was saying earlier, him and I, you know, obviously we're in awe of the collection and the cars that were there, but we were just observing how well everything was presented, the, the space, you know, especially the motorcycles. Because motorcycles, doing a motorcycle show, especially if you're just doing a motorcycle show, it's hard to make it not look like a showroom, because, you know, just putting them all, but the way you displayed them, making them look they're like displayed they're displayed in motion. Yeah, they're displayed yeah. in yeah. motion to the point where, you know, even if you don't perhaps love cars or motorcycles, whatever it may be, everyone can appreciate what they're seeing yeah. just because of how beautifully it's presented. And it helps you understand what each motorcycle's function is yeah. through the time. And even just how they're displayed, obviously, yes, they're displayed in motion, but the cords, you see them through the mounting point and you can't see where they're anchored. It's just yeah. everything's Everything so, was all those clean. details yeah. are so clean. Yeah. And putting museum exhibitions together like we do, it's it was very, very cool to study. And, it, and coming in here today yeah. with how you have it laid out with the elevator and yeah. uh, just other small details in here is just well, great to absorb. What's nice too is that you present every everything in a very, uh, in a manner that doesn't make someone who doesn't know cars necessarily feel dumb, right? You know, you explain what different hot rods are, the mm -hmm. different different types of race car in a very, like you were saying, like almost third grade level that everyone can understand and relate to and, mm -hmm. you know can say oh yeah now i understand what that car means in this era mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. so that was 
our biggest takeaway, I would say. So that was very, very cool. good. I like it. Listen, keep going. I'm, I'm <laughs> digging also, this. When we ate in the Manx Cafe, the first thing uh, I noticed, there's like, for those who haven't been to the Peterson, there's a uh, Manx, it's called the Manx Cafe. Uh, the Myers Manx, is that correct? Based yeah. on the, the dune, the dune buggy. And um, there's a picture of Bruce and Steve McQueen with a 356 uh, Speedster, a 1600 Super. And there happens to be a black one here. And the first one I, uh, the first question I asked Bruce was, is that the car in the picture? And you have a kind of an interesting story. Well, to I do, but I want to get to that in a minute because okay. I want to go back sure. to just kind of carry on the Peterson thing. And I'd be yeah. happy to talk about Steve because he was a friend. Good. Um, you know, this goes back to Terry Cargus. Yeah. Uh, um, there is not a chip of paint. There is not a spot of dust anywhere. The, it's spotlessly clean. Yeah. And that's the way this place is. Yeah. The motorcycle gallery is the Richard Varner Motorcycle Gallery. Richard mm -hmm. is the chairman at, uh, of Moto America, which is a motorcycle racing series. Uh, he has a great sense of design. And, and that... that um, what I appreciate what you said because I have some motorcycles here and I, I put them up on the wall because I just couldn't find a way to other than just make it look like a rock store parking lot, exactly. you know, yeah. they're very hard to, to be able to appreciate and, yep. and check out the design. So, well, I think our motorcycle exhibit is pretty special. It's fabulous. It's the, yeah. I think, I think the best way to see a motorcycle is to see it in motion. And I mean, I'm an avid track rider and I, I'm the happiest when I see a bike fully leaned over and that's what it's made to do. And you mentioned Moto America. One of the first things that I saw when I walked in was Wayne Rainey's suit and helmet up on the wall over there. And what an incredible organization that is not to get off topic, but I mean, I, I, I have to say the the display of the motorcycles just, it, it I felt the adrenaline Good. when I saw it. It doesn't right. look like you're just walking into the dealership. Right. That's how I always feel, though, because right. I want to yeah. buy all of them. And, <laughs> and, and, yeah, and good variety, too. Oh, amazing you know, variety. And, and, and one of the other things I want to mention at the Peterson, and I'm sure this is much the same at the Audrain, mm. is that if you look at, a, at, at, at our guests, the demographic is so varied i mean there's every ethnicity Absolutely. every age yeah gender i mean mm -hmm. we appeal to everybody so it's not like you could bring your mother in there and you, and she would be entertained of course by the design and the yeah. color and that type of thing so we we think we've really nailed it as far as a broad appeal i mm -hmm. i really i mean i'm the child of the group i'm the youngest <laughs> of the group and i enjoyed the the kids section that you guys made as well i mean i collect hot wheels and to see all of the, the Hot Wheels displays that you had and even the dirt bikes that the kids could sit on to say, hey, you know, dad, can I get a dirt bike kind of thing? But yeah, I mean, an area and a space for everyone and it, it's a welcoming space. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm really glad that yeah. you enjoyed it and, and in getting to the Porsche. Yes, that's right. Um, you know, what's, what's interesting, um, we did a, a, a panel discussion not long ago with um, I think Jay Leno and, and Don Losborn might have been on that and, and Keith Martin. Anyways, we had a great group of experts mm -hmm. talking about the future of, of, the, uh, of the collecting. And it all came down to one word, and that's Porsche. Yes. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> My, I have a 47-year-old son who's yeah. been a Porsche file since birth. I, I've... I bought my first Porsche in 1960. So we have a running we have a running joke on this podcast. We talk about Porsche so much yeah, that, that we have it, to say, we have to like yeah. stop talking okay. because we are okay. such avid Porsche Well, I didn't know that. So no, no, so, no, which is no, great. That's no, that's <laughs> no I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I love it all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, um, and my favorite car is behind me, the the Cobra. So yeah. So I'm, I'm, I love it all, and I love you know the experience of driving all mm -hmm. these different cars, but. Um, early, early on, back in, in, in 1960, is when I started driving Porsche. And I bought a Porsche Speedster in the kind of mid-60s, uh, a black one, rudge wheel, and, and I, I paid $1,500 for it. And the fellow said to me when I, when I bought it, he said, uh, that used to belong to Steve McQueen. Well, I didn't care. Oh, wow. I, I just didn't. I mean, yeah. Steve McQueen was, you know, he was yeah. doing a TV series and a cool guy. We, yeah. used to, we raced motorcycles. And I mean, he was definitely a cool guy. Yeah. But it didn't, it wouldn't have brought a premium. Sure. And so I had the car about, about a dozen years and Steve calls me. It's a long story, but he heard I had the car, denied that it was his. I didn't care because I love the car. 
and then decided he wanted to see it, determined that it absolutely was his car, that absolutely had to have it. <laughs> and, and so I didn't want to sell it, and my wife said, don't you sell that car, you love that car. Yeah. So anyways, to make a long story short, I did sell it back to Steve with the idea, I'm thinking, well, he'll have it for a month and get tired of it. Because mm -hmm. at the time, he was buying a lot of cars and motorcycles, he had a little hanger up in Santa okay. Paula. So I figured it'll come back my way, yeah. and this is the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, he passed away sh not long after that, okay. and now Chad, his son, has it. But it is an identical twin to that yeah. car. So that's a black Rudge Wheel Speedster Super. And, and I've had that car probably 40 years. It's a fabulous car. So what you see here in this room, this is about, I, I keep about half my cars here. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, where am I going with this? Um, uh, let me think where I was. Yeah, well, well what, I, what I see is someone who. Um, oh, I remember I was going to say buys what they truly enjoy. Yeah. Right. You, you don't necessarily collect to, to collect. You buy what you love. Yep. And and to, to me, did you read my mind? Research. Are we are we like? No, no because we, that's it's funny. We, I was we did a little research and we had a lot of similarities. And um, yeah, and I, you had to convince your dad to get the three fifty six. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, if, for him, it was a compact car. He had no idea. Yeah. He didn't know a Peugeot from a Pontiac to a Porsche. <laughs> that was exactly like my Lucky. dad. Yeah, yeah I, I was going to say, that's perfect. perfect I had recipe. to convince my dad for my first car to be a 1995 Land Rover Defender 90, which is my favorite car, Defenders. And I had to convince him why it's so safe, even though it had no airbags. <laughs> and, you know, it just resonated with me when reading about that. And, you know, that, I'm someone who, yeah, I say I love Porsche, but Land Rover is my favorite brand. Uh, you know, I love the, the 250 short wheelbase Ferrari is my all time favorite Ferrari. Um, so I, I really appreciate you, you, you buy what you truly love and the fact that you drive it, especially the Kremer. Tom was saying you drive that on the road. Yeah, I do. It's just, you know, that's, that's the dream right <laughs> well, there. When so. we, we did a lot of reading about you, Bruce, and, and got pretty familiar with your story, but I saw, um, we're at Pebble last year. And I saw the 935 at uh, the Monterey uh, Historics. And I said, wow, that's a beautiful car. It's a great seat in person. And then the next day, I see it on the field at Pebble Beach. And that yeah. was just one of the coolest things, seeing yep. it on oh, both places. Yeah, we did. That was amazing. Uh, that was, I, to me, that's kind of the epitome of your style. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and just something just flashed into my mind. So I grew up in a family that had no time for cars. This, yep, sure. First of all, we didn't have the money. And the idea of wasting your time with an automobile is, I mean, that, that's yeah. like, Really? You what know, you crazy? can't you get a job? Do something productive. <laughs> so so that has its advantages and disadvantages. And I really didn't think about it till you mentioned it. Um, I always wished that my dad were a car guy. But if yeah. my dad were a car guy, I wouldn't have any of this stuff. That's right. Because I would never been able to get yeah. that Porsche idea, you know, right. done. Yeah. Yeah. Because honestly, he I, I'd ordered a Chevrolet and he 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 grew up in the Depression. So the idea of the bottom of the line you know, appealed to him, you know, why pay for f extras? So I had a Biscayne Chevy all picked out, which was the cheap, cheap post, you know, yeah. stripped down model with a monster engine mm -hmm. in it. <laughs> and so it was $2,400, I remember it. I mean, I was just ready to hit the go button and he had agreed, you know, oh, I like the idea of look that, you know, that, you know, Chevy yeah. business mm -hmm. coupe, we called it, you know, it was good. So then when I, when I, you know, switched up and went with the Porsche, I went back, I said, dad, you know, that thing's a big V8, you know, <laughs> I'm going with a compact, yeah. but I would never have gotten it across. My, my kid couldn't get that across with me, yeah, you know? no, that's hilarious. but you're right. So it, it has its advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. And kind of what you see here is, is, is uh, 50 years of one car at a time. Just it's, it's, um, it's, I, I fall in love with a car and, and I, you know, pay up. I don't yeah. think I've gotten any bargains in this room, but that's fine. You know, it, it, I bought what I liked. I, I can't say I've ever sold a car that, mm -hmm. a, that a meaningful car. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it's what it is. And I'm glad to hear you like the short wheelbase. Cause that was, that was a dream car for me too. I can, and you got that for your 60th. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. That's quite, it, quite, quite the way to celebrate a 60th yeah. birthday. Yeah. I, I Everybody I like when you turn 60, you owe yourself something. Yeah, that's a good way. To, and, and, and yeah, and that is a, just an absolutely beautiful car. Yeah. I think the only other one I saw was at the Ferrari museum and, um, yeah, it's just, I just love, I've always loved short wheelbase Ferraris. I, I agree with you. It's a, a kind of an aggressive look. Yeah. 
Um, and the nice thing about the short wheelbase, and I have several friends with GTOs. Yep. You know, I could have been a GTO owner, but I just wasn't. Great story. I wasn't Alan DeCadney or some of these guys that really knew their stuff. Yeah. Because a, 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 a GTO was quite a bit less money than my 4Cam, which I've had for 53 mm -hmm. years. But um, I've always loved those cars. And you can drive in that car. I did it last weekend and have a conversation. Mm. In a GTO, you need headsets. Yeah. You can't hear a thing. Yeah. And, and my favorite car, uh, one of my favorites of all time, is, is, uh, is a 275 GTB owned by Preston Hinn in Florida, one Le Mans, a yellow one with number 24 Fabulous on it. Fabulous car, yeah. Oh, my God. Well, um, uh, uh, Kevin Jeanette had it down yep. in Florida for sale. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he uh, offered uh, if we wanted to drive it. So a friend of mine drove it. I was in the passenger seat. That car... It was the loudest car I've ever been in in my entire wow. life. Wow. Yeah. It, it took months before my hearing came back. <laughs> wow. Now, I should have had earplugs. Yeah. But so there's, the, you know, you can get into some of these great looking cars or exotic race cars with super loud, you know, uh, mm -hmm. makes a lot of noise, but it's painful. But both the, the Bitserini, the Cobra, and the uh, uh, short wheelbase, you don't need earplugs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you ever need headphones, Bruce, for a ride like that, you know who to call. <laughs> yeah, now. that's We've right. Yeah, these are extras. these are pretty fancy. <laughs> I like yeah, these. These really are comfortable. We're so in the car chamber. <laughs> when you when you purchase the so we we at, as we said we did some research and when you purchase the the four cam, um, you've stated that it was your entire life savings. That was my net worth. How how did that? How did you? you obviously love cars. How did you justify that purchase? What was the feeling like when you, when sure. you pulled the trigger? So I, my, my first, I had cars before the, my first Porsche, because when I went to college, they had a, a, a desk, you know, you'd check in all these little, you know, stations. And one of them was a student loan station. Mm -hmm. My dad had given me tuition, but you know, I found you could take a loan out. Yeah. Why not? You know, interest free, pay yeah. it back by the end of the year. So now I had a fistful of money. So I did buy some cars and motorcycles. So I've always kind of been into the tangibles. I, I, I love things. I'm not a stock market guy. I just like things that I can shape and understand. So um, I had bought a Porsche uh, in 1967 and I was getting it serviced and probably late 67, early 68. And that very car pulled into, it was SD Zipper Motor Car Company in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And I imagine it was like using your first, you know, supermoto or something. I mean, it was like, oh my God, I saw that car bright yellow. I'd never seen anything that color before. And it was a 275 GTB4 cam. And so I went to the service manager and made it known, like, if that guy ever wants to sell that car, let me know. And I had, I had no idea what it cost. Yeah. And I nor did I ever think it would ever come my way, but I was, you know, just why not? Yeah. You know? So to make a long story short, a few years later, it was for sale and I bought it. Mm -hmm. And I paid $10,500 for it. Which, and yeah, that was yeah. my net worth. I mean, I sold everything. I just cashed everything in. So that was in 1970. Uh, and I've kept it since then. And you have the best license plate. Well, that's my company. I know. That's why it's fun. And have you had that yeah. license plate since? When they, when they first started customizing license plates. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. just could not imagine seeing that car in 1967. Yeah. It must have been like seeing an alien. It would be like seeing a Mura or I, I, yeah. whatever cars in your generation, yeah. you know, is like an oh my God moment. I'd never seen anything so beautiful. And the only, and I talk, we've talked about this a little bit before, but you know, I'm, I'm a bit older than them. So when I was growing up, I didn't have social media. So when you saw, you know, these cars, you only saw them in magazines. You only saw them mm -hmm. in, you know, Jay Leno talking about them or wherever it was. And then you see it in person and it's like meeting your hero and your hero meeting up to those expectations. And the fact that you still have it and you'll, You'll have it forever. Is, yeah, um, I, I like that it's not red. <laughs> <laughs> That's, if it would have been red, it would have been red. You yeah, know, no, yes. but it was just it was just seeing that yellow. Yeah, just is is a knockout. What Jalo? I know they have a. Is it Jalo Modena or or? Uh, it, it, well, it's fly yellow okay. and Jalo. And a friend of mine had a yellow Fiat, and the license plate was Jalo, G I A L L O, which yeah. is yellow. And he said, "I'm selling my Fiat. Do you want the license plate?" And I thought. <laughs> yeah, and then I thought, well, nobody's going to know what that means. Yeah, <laughs> and and the funny thing is, I, I for a long time, 
I, I love Jello, J E L L O. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I have, and I still have that license plate stuck on the ad in something. But yeah, but that I just love that license plate. So I ran that for the first probably, you know, umpteen years with Jello. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Not Jello, but um, yeah, fun. That's funny. I don't know if they make a yellow Jello, but. Not, yeah, they do. Not too late. Lemon they yellow. Do. It's not, it's oh, not that good. Not, I'm, not, I'm all set. <laughs> but like, like our um, uh, museum chairman, you have uh, eclectic taste that, that ranges, but uh, we know you have a love for hot rods. And we've got some around the corner here that I'm sure we'll get some B-roll of, but um, we put together an East Coast hot rod show in the museum, which was really fun to uh, learn about and hear stories from um, all the guys who created the stories, you know, in those times. But... I'm curious, it's kind of a two-part question, but I'm curious, A, what is it about the hot rodding culture that you love so much? And B, do you see any similarities to 50s, late 40s hot rod culture and car culture today? Good. Good A and B. Yeah. <laughs> One at uh, a time. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, hot rodding, when I was in the 40s, was like, a forbidden fruit. My parents, I mean, I may as well have been a hell's angel. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. those, that was just not, yeah. you know, not that acceptable. was not. Yeah. And so it was, and I loved it. And I cut out pictures in Hot Rod magazine. And I really, I really liked the look of the hot rods. I had it all picked out and there were no money. I mean, right. you could buy a 40 Ford for $50, a hundred dollars. So a hundred dollars would buy you a hot rod back mm -hmm. then. Wow. And, and so I say you're never too old to have a happy childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So later on in life, it was in the late 70s, a friend of mine, Jim Busby, who's an uh, IMSA racer, Porsche guy, he had a little red high boy, 32. And, I, and, he, and he drove it. We were down in Newport. I saw the car. And I, it just like, oh, my God. I said, Jim, if you ever think about selling that car, let me know. Of course, that was like on Saturday. On, su on Monday, it was parked in front of my house. You know? <laughs> it was $15,000, oh, wow. you know. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. So that kind of got me going. And, and, and I drove it. And everywhere you drive with a hot rod, you get thumbs up. Nobody's, yeah. you're not pretending to be anybody you're just out there having a good time and mm -hmm. i think that's one of the purest forms of motorsport yes. the hot rods first of all there's no right and there's no wrong it's just whatever you like whether it's a chevy engine or a ford engine or a you know you know whatever configuration of wheel and stance you know i mm -hmm. mean i have my preference but you know in hot rodding everything nothing's goes. incorrect nothing's incorrect mm -hmm. and and so i like that about it and then I started researching into historic hot rods, the, the cars that I thought were plenty cool back in the 40s and 50s. And so I thought, I've got to find some of these old cars and restore them just for mankind. So then I started, you know, it's like, started like, you know, ankle deep and then just, yeah. oh. I went <laughs> right in. Yeah. I, I think I have 1032 Forge now, which yeah. is wow. great. more than anybody should have. But, you know, uh, eight of them are super historic and mm -hmm. two of them, one of them I race at Bonneville and one of them, uh, you know, I drive around, just kick around in. But they're just a fun approach. Mm -hmm. And what was the B part? The B part was, do you see any connection between 50s and 60s hot rodding when it was, you know, in their prime? and car culture today and how people modify and adjust their cars. Well, in, 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 in my day, you did, your, the, you did your own work on the car. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it, they were pretty simple. It wasn't computers, sure. it was pretty, pretty sure. rudimentary. Um, in today's world, I think it's tougher for a young person like yourself that really wants to get involved and you don't have the program from BMW or from wherever it is. Yeah. So it's, I think there's less hands on. Mm -hmm. That's just my, yeah. what I think. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, I, I, I think the enthusiasm has, you know, because of Uber and some of that, maybe there's people that figure out they can get by without driving a car. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I can't imagine it, but no. there are people that yeah. just, <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. I don't know where they they're are. Crazy. Yeah. They're, they're crazy. They're crazy. But I, I think there's some similar. It's just in youthful passion. Yeah. And and there's also a club here in in Southern California called the Shifters. And basically they do like um, satin cars, you know. They they they, they you know, I would close I don't want to call it a jalopy, yeah. but it's yeah. it's it's just really fundamental stuff yeah. and they and they have a great time. Yeah. And for them it's more about lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you're a shifter it's the lifestyle, you yeah. know, and the girls dress alike, a lot of tattoos and, yep. 
and and um, you know they have as much fun as anybody can have. Yeah. I will I will yeah. never forget being in the museum one day a few years ago, and uh, an older gentleman uh, and his wife said to me, you know, it's really sad. You know, kids aren't into cars these days. You know, no one's working on their cars, but kids don't like cars anymore. And yeah. I was shocked standing in the museum that I worked in, <laughs> yeah. and I responded by kid. saying, well, yeah, you're right. I have a BMW. I don't really work on my car, but if I pull out this app, I can add 50 horsepower to it in about five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and, and yes, it's changed a lot, but one thing, you know, being on the East Coast, obviously there's a lot, a lot of differences from the West Coast, but East Coast hot riders, you see these photos of they're in this single car open garage with a sheet covering uh you know the uh where the door would go then they'd have you know maybe a propane tank or a space heater yeah and they'd be working on these things for 10 hours a day oh, on the yeah. weekends yeah and the the like you said for 100 150 dollars you've got yourself a hot rod and mm -hmm. i think you know without those days automotive culture in this country is incredibly different having the hot rods lead to the muscle car craze and and off mm -hmm. of that so yeah you, are you you could be my son <laughs> you know i i agree i i, I agree well, be, yeah. because that is you know the scarab the yeah, the, yeah. you know the uh cobras yep these and and so much of detroit the innovation came from hot rodding mm -hmm. oh 100 percent. So, so it was a it was really the fundamental i'm i, I hot rodding is something that's underappreciated and it should be yeah. have a greater appreciation yeah and the big news there is you just donated your mcgee roadster right to peterson yeah and uh that is one of the if not the most important hot rod probably yeah so that's uh yeah i i i, I bought that car a long time ago and it was the first kind of hot rod on the cover of hot rod magazine and and by the way there's a kind of an east coast look and a west coast look yeah mm -hmm. and the and the west, the east coast is more channeled yep. and just different. West Coast guys chop the top more than the East Coast guys. Yes, and the West Coast guys are what they call high boys, which they leave the body mounted on top of the frame. Mm -hmm. But because of rust and all the things that, you know, can attack cars on the East Coast, sometimes you lose the whole bottom of the car, so you just channel, you just lay the car down over the rails in it. And it's kind of a racy look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, this car just defines uh, West Coast high boy, and it was one of the very first really important you know 32 fords ever it was the first kind of road going hot rod on the cover of hot rod in 1948 and um it had so many first you know hidden door hinges and three-piece hood and a veed spreader bar and on and on and on and it was built by a fellow named bob mcgee who was a football player at usc mm -hmm. so it's film you know the photo was taken by it says photo by pete which is robert e peterson took the photo himself oh, wow and and out here when guys wanted to, you know, sh contest each other, because, you know, when you got two cars, you got a race, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> but out here, you, you had the, the luxury of dry lakes. You had Harper's and Muroc and El Mirage. And so every other week they would do, you know, they would go to the dry lakes and just run flat out. You know, and some, and, you know, for some of these hot rods to go 112, 13, 14, yeah, 120 miles fast. an hour is incredible. hauling ass. Oh, yeah. yeah big time so you know there was a way of having that and you got a little plaque for your dash so the guy that had that you know the high speed yeah that was that was probably a badge of honor uh -huh. so so um out here we just had better weather places to run them the drag races were conceived out here by wally parks so this was really yeah. mecca really the ground yep. zero of hot rodding. Yeah, and on the East Coast, we call that cheating. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, without dry lakes and, you know, a lot of street racing going on, you had um, old naval bases being converted into drag strips, and, and many of those aren't existing anymore. And there's, the, I think the only one in Rhode Island is now a, a, a state park that has more asphalt than you could imagine. And I always think to myself, well, it would be great to bring this back to a drag strip, but uh, maybe for electric cars, because the, 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 uh, the gas-powered ones are too loud. But I think, uh, like I said, I just think the world would be different without hot rods. Today. I agree. Yeah. Well, I, I would agree with that. It's funny you brought that up, because we did bring you some gifts. And this oh, is gift wow. metal. Hat. I don't, I don't like know if you can it. wear oh, yeah. that in your museum. But. <laughs> yeah, I can. I can, sure. It's a great logo, and, by the and, way. And we wanted to mention. Yeah. So, uh, so we're on our way out on Friday, and you know, not, we stopped and show it to said you goodbye yet. to Donald. And <laughs> we're saying, oh, we need to get a gift for, for Bruce. And when Donald turned around, I snagged this photo. So we, but, but we we're stole hoping this you can from Donald, it. but you can have it now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but it's the, uh, I believe it's the Muroc Dry Lakes that you just uh, yeah, mentioned. They all kind of look the same. Muroc and El Mirage. It's one of those two. Harper's was less used. 
But I think this that's is from this is a really look at the wheels on that trailer. I mean, you know, these guys would you know trailer the car from Hollywood. I yep. don't know if you you've all seen this. Yeah, yeah. Um, they trailer the car. Can you get Sean's that? Sean's our trailer guy for us. Yeah, so I drive all the trailers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, they would drive out there. They camp on the on the dry lake. Yeah. I mean, it was, and, and you get a dust on these dry lakes that is like you wouldn't believe, right? silicone. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I had just got a new Suburban, and I went out, and, and when I bought the Pearson Brothers Coupe, I mean, I, I think that Suburban still has, you know, <laughs> layer of silt. Yeah. 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 Well, this, thank you. Yeah. This is great fun. And uh, I don't know if this is for me or yeah, yeah, that's that's for you. oh well, you. thank you that's very much. You. All, yes. that, all that's for you. Well, I love this stuff, and I, I love the history. And there's there have been several books written, you know, with, that have old hot rods mm -hmm. in it. So I love that I can just sit and look at. I can I can start right now with the beginning of hot rod. I don't need a new magazine. I can just read them over and over yeah, and over yeah. again, and I just see different stuff. You know. Yeah. Yep. Well, we were mentioning that the Peterson did that video series on Jeff Goldstein's <laughs> Piston Palace in Rhode Island. And he is, he's like an almanac for us. And we, we learned a lot from him. Uh, well, he's a terrific yeah. guy, a real mm -hmm. enthusiast, truly loves hot rods and customs and, yep. and really gets into it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. He really knows his stuff. Um, so, so I have a question for you. I, I was reading that when you were younger, you bought a motorcycle and you hit it at a friend's house. Were, were you not allowed to have motorcycles? Was it? it oh was my like God, was, no! You, were be, you mentioned the Hell's Angels. Oh I, mean, yeah. I don't know if they would. Your parents would have thought that you were you were in a biker gang or. Um, oh God, motorcycles! They were so. You know, they, they they never knew. They wouldn't ever think that I was that kind. I yeah. mean, <laughs> it was never. I I had a I mowed lawns. I set bowling pins. I I had the best paper corner in L.A. So I was like. I was probably making, you know, ten, fifteen dollars a week. Yeah. And 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 you know, and in a month I could afford a forty Ford, and a motorcycle was like nothing. Yeah. So so uh, you know, I started out with a motorized bike, and then a Whizzer kind of bike, and then and then a cool. BSA, and I could hide these at friends' houses, and the parents wouldn't rat me out because they didn't <laughs> even know what they were either. They didn't even know where it came from. So it was just I had motorcycles in friends' garages and. And, and that's kind of how it started for me. And I, I've loved motorcycles. Yeah. I thought, if I, life isn't worth living without a motorcycle. Yeah. So I dated my wife on a motorcycle. Oh, wow. yeah. um, everything I did was on motorcycles. That was my, in, at college, everywhere. Every weekend we'd go racing. Back then, they had what was called TT scrambles. Mm. So it was like, it was kind of rudimentary motocross. But, sure. you know, it was dirt racing. And, and, and we had desert races. That's what McQueen did with the Eakins and... So motorcycles are a really big part of my life mm -hmm. and nothing more fun. Now, you know, at my age, I've gone into what I call preservation mode. <laughs> yeah. And I don't ride motorcycles anymore. I don't yeah. snow ski anymore. I don't sure. want to get hit yeah, by a snowboarder. Yeah. Yeah. I can't yeah. afford to fall down. And it scares me with the way some of these people ride their motorcycles. And yeah. I'm sure yeah. if I were in my 30s, it wouldn't scare me at all. But it's just terrifying. Yeah, and, you know, like we were saying, I do most of the trailering for all of our cars and the amount of people who are facetiming or like watching videos oh, on their yeah, phone that's yeah. what gets me it's that like, is what turned me off a of motorcycle yeah, i just built yeah. a new harley and it was a really kind of a sport bike and i i had it right up here at the corner and i always at every intersection i would ride up to the front i'd just find my way to the front and i remember looking both sides of me and both people were were like their with their phones like this i thought they're gonna kill me yeah. i literally rode my bike to the back tom kenny who works with me here i said tom i'm done yep it's over. I'm never riding again. I because they're gonna kill me. Yeah, that's and it's yeah. It's funny. We, another thing we relate on. I I wasn't allowed to have motorcycles growing up, and I purchased one and I hid it at my friend's <laughs> house too. So it's a good. Well, they're hideable and yeah, they're, they're hideable. Know, and for sure. That's where we used to we used to work on it. Did your parents ever find out? Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> of course they did. Yeah. But yeah. it was it was after college. I yeah, mean, so I you're fine. I'd gone. I mean, I was an adult at that point. Yeah. And on the weekends, we'd race motorcycles. And actually, it was a senior year at Berkeley, and, and there was a, a race at Pittsburgh, California. It was a, basically a, a TT Scrambles. And so my father's friend's daughter was at the races, 
and introduced herself. We just chatted, and off I went, and I raced. And so she mentioned to her dad, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I saw Bruce Meyer, and he was racing his motorcycle. And so, you know, nonchalantly, not ratting me out or anything, but then he just mentioned to to uh, my dad, you know, I, you know, whatever her name was, saw Bruce racing his motorcycle. My dad said, oh, he doesn't have a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> well, but he did check it out, yeah, you know, and well, I could never lie to my parents. Yeah, I, yeah. I, that would, that never, ever, ever happened. I just, there's a lot they didn't know, and that was one thing. Yeah, that's good. That's, they that's, weren't happy about that. That's funny. So I, I grew up around motorcycles, and when I was younger, probably five, six, I was begging my parents all day, every day, can I have a dirt bike, can I have a dirt bike? They, they probably wanted to wring my neck for how annoying I was being. And my mom would always say no, and my dad would always say yes. And I finally wore them down. And the day that I got my, my first dirt bike was like the greatest day ever. So, I mean, the, the happiness that you get from, at least I get from, from two wheels with us being on the East Coast, I'll go all winter. And I know I'm depressed because I haven't ridden my motorcycle. But yeah. on that first nice spring day that I get out and I get on that bike, it's it's the best. It's I, I totally agree with you. You cannot live without two wheels. There's, in my opinion, I think there's no better way to see the world and the back roads and mm -hmm. the smells and the sights. And, and it's it's really the only time I feel like I'm, I'm actually calm. Mm. I might be going fast. Yeah. But in my mind, everything just settles, and I'm calm, and I'm focused. And I think those are my happiest moments are when I'm on two wheels. What kind of bikes do you ride? Uh, so I, I'm Italian, and I get made fun of. I, I love Ducati. I have a Ducati Panigale. Um, I've, I've been doing a lot more track stuff on that just because it's so fast on the road that it's – you look down, you're doing 150, and you're not even trying. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> you, know. you guys have a lot in common, actually. Antonio's very proper. He's very polite. And then you see him leave work on this absolute death <laughs> machine. <laughs> and Antonio passed me one time on a closed course. Yeah, we'll call uh, it a closed course. Yeah, course. it was – I had my jaw drop for a good 15 seconds. It was shockingly fast, that thing. Uh, but – like you said, he's been riding for 20 years. Yeah. He's been riding yeah. two wheels for 20 years. More than cars. Yeah. I mean, my, my car track record's not that good. As yeah. a, <laughs> as a, as a, yeah. You haven't dumped a bike yet, yeah. at least recently. No, no. Oh, I, hopefully I, never. Yeah. yeah, I crashed my Porsche, but I didn't... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't crashed the bike. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's Knock on wood. Story for another podcast, yeah. I guess. Well, uh, you be careful. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, I, I, find, I find that the... Uh, like you said, I mean, I'm, I'm young and, and I know, and my dad always tells me when you're young, you don't think about things, but I, I have noticed, I don't know if maybe because I'm getting a little bit older is like you said, every intersection or when you're on the highway or you're on a back road and someone just cuts in front of you. I mean, it's, it's, it's the lack of care. I think maybe at least here people might be more used to motorcycles because of the greater population and be better weather, but being on the racetrack is so much safer because you're in a controlled environment. Everyone is going the same direction. If you crash, there's an ambulance there. You have to wear a, a, a full suit. Now they're starting to mandate airbag suits in a lot of the organizations. So it's getting a lot safer, and, and it's just... It's where the bike wants to be. It's where it's happy. Um, if I may interject, is that the conversation you had with your parents when you I tried to? Yeah, sell? <laughs> yeah I was like, <laughs> Dad, please, <laughs> it's safe. What'd you say? A, view, a viewer question. Yeah. Okay. What was? Do you remember the first vehicle, whether it was a motorcycle or car, that started? that immediate oh i i need to can you hear can you hear him hold on steve we go ahead i can what was do you remember the first vehicle whether it was a motorcycle or car that started that immediate oh i i need to call these cars it's in your dna you know you know i i have three children and and they're great kids and they've grown up with all this but it took on one i i think you couldn't take the car out of me mm-hmm I mean, it's just in your DNA or it's not. And, uh, it, you know, there was no aha moment that I thought, I'm going to be a car guy. Yeah. It, it's just, it, you know, it's just uh, something like that you love, you know. And uh, I would absolutely agree with that. I mean, I remember from. I as, don't have that first moment. I, I, I mean, I remember. I do. Going just on road trips with my parents happened. and at nighttime looking 
in the mirror and trying to identify what kind of car was by the <laughs> headlights. headlights. Yeah. Just, you know, those are the some of my earliest memories. Mm-hmm. So I completely agree. I think it's within your DNA. And like I said, my brother, my mom, and my dad could care less about cars. But here I am, you know, <laughs> yeah. talking to you in probably one of the most incredible collections in the world and, you know, being able to be a part of the Audrain and what we do. And it's, it's a well, dream every day. Well, um, thank you. And one of the, the wonderful things I think about the car hobby is that it doesn't matter if you're Nick or Joe or anybody, you know, the, the car hobby is the most welcoming hobby. Um, when I take a car out and you can just see it lights up some mm-hmm. person, and you don't care if they own a car, they don't own a car, they've got a model on their desk, it just doesn't matter. If, they, if you got that love for the car in your DNA, you love sharing it. Mm-hmm. You love being with people that you know to share it with, and and we have a group uh, in our museum called the Checkered Flag 200, yep. Yep. and and some of those people have extraordinary, like Chip Connor, you know, yeah, GTOs and that yeah. kind of stuff. But um, there's people in there that you know that don't have a car but just love the car, yeah. and and you could put. You could put the four of us in a room and we could go for a week. I know, yeah. Just it's, telling stories, and it doesn't matter, you know, if you have a Ducati or, or a, you know, a, a Dodge. You know, we just love this stuff. Yeah. And so that's the wonderful and welcoming part that I love so much about yeah. the hobby. And that's why I've dedicated so much of my life to the museum and to just sharing the joy. Every car in here runs, we drive everything. And, and the drive is what's really mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that is a very good note to end on today. I, we can't thank you enough for your time. And I want to say, I don't want to say that we brought the rain with us. It is, you can hear that it's <laughs> raining. Um, but I thank you so much. This has been incredible, an incredible space to be in. Um, we, we, we are enjoying ourselves so much here. And... If you like content like this, remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share. If you want to ask Bruce a question, put it in the in the comments. Um, we'll answer it <laughs> on, on our end. But uh, thank you so much. Thank for, you so much, yeah, Bruce. Yeah. Oh no, it's thank a pleasure. You. I love your. Uh, you know, the, the, you guys are just everything that we love about the hobby, and we appreciate. And uh, I will get back the Audrain. Yeah. And I look forward to that. Yeah. And we've uh, we've actually acquired some cars from the Peterson, the um, you know, the Pippa Gardner the Pippa collection, Gardner of cars, collection, which are very funky. Uh, we've showed a couple of those in the museum. The Catherine Hepburn, uh, the old uh, what kind of car is that again? I can't remember off the top of my head. It's a Lincoln, right? Yeah, Con- is it a Continental? I think it's a Continental. Yeah. You also bought, an, I want to say Nick, Nick. Um, oh God, he you bought his whole collection. And David Sidorik bought an Aston Martin from him, but I went down to Nick's garage when he had the Speedster and the 904 yes. and yep. some of these cars all scattered oh, around the garage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Just mirror. amazing. And I thought you guys bought it really, really well. Yeah. That was and a, bought great stuff. Oh, mm-hmm. that was a, yeah. We, uh, funny, funny story on that is when we, f- I went there to, with our team when we found out about it. And the transaction happened, and the caretaker um, was like, "Okay, so when are you guys gonna come back?" And like, oh, you know, a week or two weeks, you can um, to collect the cars. And as you were saying, that three reliable <laughs> trucks pulled up, and you know, we <laughs> ended up, to, you know, with the money. Great trend. stuff. Yeah, and uh, the 904 ended up winning best in its class at Pebble last year, which was fabulous. And um, everything, everything at this point has been uh, refreshed to run perfectly. So yes. they're getting some great road time. And, he had uh, a Pegaso and a Mura. Two Pegasos. I mean, he, yep. the guy Which, was, you know, yeah. uh, you know, like next level. I mean, a real thinker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very bright man. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think he picked up that Porsche Speedster. And it was bought a brand new. Yeah. Bought a brand he new. bought a brand new 10,000 mile Speedster. It's a, it's a super, it's a 1600 Super. Um, it was a 55 technically i think it's technically a 55 uh, but the it was a late 55 mm-hmm. um did you know that, mr begovich Bruce? i did what was he like well he was quiet modest you know he, um he he wouldn't share that garage you had to know him to sure. get in is that right yeah um but uh and 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 a good part of his his uh uh net worth went to caltech and different yeah, schools yeah, exactly 
So he, that was a big part of his. And that's where all the money from the sale went to, yes. is to the school, which, is, like which is great to know as well. Yeah. So. Yeah, two of those cars you'll see this summer at great. a show. Yeah. <laughs> great. <laughs> at a show on maybe great. East Coast. <laughs> good, good. Well, I look forward to that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I appreciate your coming out here and, you know, sharing what we do out here with your followers back east. And I'll be sure and log into the, what is it, Audrain? The Audrain Museum Network. Yeah, we'll, we'll send <laughs> that over. Audrain Museum Network. Yep. I'll see you there. All, All right. right. Thank, Thank you, you again. so much, Bruce. Bruce.